I'm in the trail It's time to do some talking I'm gonna find me a honky-tonk hero With a story to tell We'll have a chuckle You never know You might learn something I'm hitting the trail It's time to do some talking I'm hitting the trail It's time to do some talking You're listening to Tales from the Trail Brought to you by Cowboys and Indians Magazine. Now here's your host, Tyler Gummersall. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. On this episode of Tales from the Trail, I get to sit down with Hayes Carl, one of my favorite singer-songwriters of all time. Um, if you don't know anything about his music, you, you certainly should. You should go Google him or look him up on whatever platform you, you follow and listen to. He's a native of Texas. He's a Grammy-nominated songwriter, hard worker, man, out there touring all the time. To me, he really follows in the footsteps of um, great Texas songwriters like Guy Clark and Towns Van Zant and Lyle Lovett, and he really is carrying that torch. Just an incredible writer. So it was a huge honor to, to get to sit down with him. I caught him up at the Fox Theater in Boulder before a show. If you ever get a chance to see his show, I highly recommend it because him and his band put on an an awesome show. It was really a special night, you know, when you have a crowd that's listening to every word or or singing along or, you know, you just get that special connection. Uh, It's it's a really cool experience. And we talk a lot about songwriting, which was which was really neat, but also creative process and difference between a band and solo stuff and just his career in general. At the time of this recording, he had just released his sixth album, his sixth studio album uh, entitled What It Is, and he co-produced that with his wife, Allison Moorer. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode. Stay tuned to the end. I will tell you all about where you can find more of these episodes and also where you can find Hayes' music, etc., I'll probably add a little clip of some of the songs we talk about, just so you can have a reference of what we're talking about. But I highly recommend you go buy all his records and go to all his shows. Cool. Thanks for sitting down with me. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate it. Um, I guess my first question is kind of, uh, just tell me about the journey from, I suppose, Galveston to the uh, Fox Theater here in Boulder. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a long one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what do you want to know? Like, uh, well, so did you? Did you start out being a, a bartender at, at that little bar, or no? Uh, Just kind of hanging out. Yeah. So I, I I got out of school. I went to college in in Conway, Arkansas, a place called oh. Hendrix College. Hendrix College, mm-hmm. and I got out in '98. Last in my class with a history degree. Okay, it was pretty unemployable. But I, the whole time I had been there, like I, I knew that I wanted to do this. I wanted to be a songwriter, mm-hmm. um, singer songwriter. And uh, uh, so I was writing during that time and performing where I could. But it was in a dry county, so there were no bars to <laughs> in play Arkansas. At. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, but you know, I just had this. I had a dream. That's mm-hmm. what I wanted to do. Um, and I think I maybe didn't take the school all that seriously because I, as improbable as it was that I would actually be able to do this, um, I, in my mind, I just, I, that was the next step for me. Was I couldn't wait to get out of school and then go somewhere where I could actually... Do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, so I got out. I moved down to a place called Crystal Beach, Texas, on the Bolivar Peninsula. It's just a sort of remote beach town, and uh, I was the only guy who could play guitar and sing at the same time on the, <laughs> the whole peninsula there. And, and I, you know, I was just hanging out at all these bars. They had a lot of bars, uh, a lot of people trying not to be found, but also a lot of bars. And and uh, eventually, I got to know some of the owners, and I just started asking, you know, can I throw up a tip jar? Mm-hmm. And play some songs in the corner, and and uh, uh, I did that. So I got me a little uh, it was a PV acoustic, acoustic, yeah. yeah. And it was so I just had two inputs, a vocal and a and a, and a guitar, uh-huh. and 
uh, I would set up and just play cover songs for four hours a night. Mm. And then I started getting work at all these bars. And, and that was great. It was really fun for me. Um, although somewhat unfulfilling on the songwriting portion sure. of the thing. But I was getting to sing and play music and sing all these songs that I loved and, and get used to being in front of people. I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience and I didn't have a lot of confidence mm-hmm. um, that I was any good. And, and so that was a really good training ground for me. And then one night I, 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 was, I was doing a bunch of odd jobs during that time, um, just trying to keep some money in my pocket. And, yeah. and uh, one of my jobs was down in Galveston Island, which was a, a ferry ride across okay, the across bay the, there. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And uh, um, one night after work, I, I stumbled into this place called the Old Quarter Acoustic Cafe. Mm. And it was... Um, uh, there had been an original old quarter in Houston, uh, where Towns Van Zandt had recorded a live record, and, wow. and oh yeah, um, you know Guy Clark and Lucinda Williams and and uh, uh, Lightning Hopkins and all these folks used to hang out at yeah, um, and it burned to the ground. But one of the co-owners, uh, Rex Bell, who also played bass with Towns. Hmm. Opened up this little spot in Galveston, and it was just—it was just a songwriter room in in the purest sense. There was a, a shrine to Towns on the wall, and a shrine <laughs> to Blaze Foley, wow. and uh, and then some Lightning Hopkins stuff, That's and that cool. was it. And you walked in, and and uh, you played your own songs. They had yeah. open mic nights, and and uh, uh, so I went in there, and 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 by accident and ended up on stage and you know played a couple tunes and and uh, there were people that were nice to me and yeah. said come back and yeah. I did and that sort of became my second home that's cool and uh, so the, the bartending aspect of it <laughs> was uh, basically I was just hanging out all the time and became friends with Rex and and he only had two kinds of beer. He had Lone Star and Shiner Bach. Um, <laughs> only so two I, kinds you need, right? Yeah, so I didn't need a license. I didn't need to go to school to learn how to do that. So I, I used the bartending term loosely. I just right. I just slung beers and, and uh, kind of um, uh, just hung out. It was, it was the first time in my life kind of I got to hang out with singer-songwriters. And, and there was a lot of sort of amateur folks, you know, people coming in off the ships mm-hmm. or just locals uh, doing their own thing, all different sorts. Yeah. And, um, but the, uh, uh, on the weekends, they would have actual, you know, touring musicians. Come and through so and play. Ray Wiley Hubbard or the Sisters Morales or Steve Fromholtz or Willis Allen Ramsey or uh, Steve Young and uh, Shake Russell. It was just this long list of, of yeah. really great uh, writers and performers. And, and uh, so that was, that was a real education for me, getting to meet those people. And, and then eventually um, uh, some of them, took, the sisters, uh, took me on the road. Oh, and, neat. and Lisa Morales ended up producing my first record. Wow. And Ray Wiley Hubbard uh, took me on the road, and 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 so I just learned a lot uh, uh, from the the craft and about the craft and the business from from those people, all of whom I met yeah. uh, at, at the old that, quarter. Right, at the yeah, old quarter. Yeah, it really changed my life. And that's a really neat education, and and having a place like that, which is which is different from just a normal whatever sports bar where you're playing covers or or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that's neat that you got to get to experience that kind of in the formative period, right? Because I think maybe some people don't know any better if they just play bars that, you know. Yeah, it was, it was like I said, I had fun doing the, doing the bars, mm-hmm. and it was, it was an education of its own kind. Sure. Um, you know, how to deal with a crowd, how to, if somebody's <laughs> got a gun, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, if, what do you, if, do? <laughs> you know, how to diffuse the situation, how to make people happy. And, and also, yeah. I was playing those songs, you know, these great songs, mm-hmm. Every night, um, uh, and some of it was well-known stuff, and some of it wasn't as much. Um, but I was doing Christopherson and Merle Haggard and Lyle Lovett and sure. Towns and Jimmy Buffett and George Strait and and uh, Paul Simon and and Dylan and and whatever. And it, it just gave me. Uh, uh, I did it so much that stuff sort of became secondhand, yeah. and and I got to see what worked. For other songwriters, um, and, and as far as a crowd engaging a crowd, yeah. which are always two different things, and that's something I struggled with because 
Uh, and still to this day, it, it's it's a bit tricky for me um, because there's there's two different components to this job, and 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 melding them is can be challenging. Um, there's there's the artist component of mm-hmm. creating songs, being a songwriter, like the craft of songwriting. Yeah, yeah, and and what do you have to say, and why yeah. is it important, and mm-hmm. and um, you know what is your why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. Right? Do you have something you have to get off your chest? Are you working stuff out? Mm-hmm. Do you want to uh, express something, or do you want to just mm, uh, provide a, a soundtrack for people to have a good time, and right. or to cry in their beer, mm-hmm. or whatever? And and either way is fine. But I was trying to sort out like what what does songwriting mean to me? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, realizing that particularly with those early crowds mm-hmm. who were not maybe the most discerning. Um, Listeners. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they were paying attention at all, it was so they could hear Margaritaville. Right, a know? song that they knew. The, and yeah. And, and so, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to get tips, and I, and it feels good mm-hmm. when people are singing along with yeah. you and, and are into it. Um, <laughs> so I didn't want to go out there and every night, and especially in these places, and just, you know, turn off the crowd with my yeah. my sad attempts at, <laughs> at poetry. Um, and so there was that aspect of, okay, how do we keep people entertained? How like do we keep them engaged? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, um, uh, and, you know, sometimes they don't always go hand in hand. So in the songwriter rooms, people can listen and, and, and your more subtle stuff can go over differently. Uh, than it does in a place where you have to keep the tempo up and keep that familiarity close for for people to really yeah buy into what you're doing and find that balance. How, do you think how long did it take you to kind of find that balance? Or are you still still looking for it? I of? guess I think I'm still looking <laughs> for it. I mean, it's uh, I there's a lot of songs that I write and a lot of things I want to write or that I that I try to do that are are rewarding to me creatively. Mm-hmm. But they don't always translate yeah. uh, to an audience, right? A live audience, in particular. Um, you know, you can put it on the record, and that can be one thing. But yeah, um, I started out com- from those early years going to to folk clubs mostly. Mm. I mean, I was playing happy hour at Nymphas too. But it was it was uh, I was going into listening rooms, and you were, and that was solo mainly then. Right? I was mostly point. solo. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, and then I, I, I got a little trio, uh, mm-hmm. an Australian couple, uh, Kim Warner and Carol Young, and, oh. and the, they had a band called the Green Cards. Yeah, um, yeah. And Kim plays with Robert O'Keefe now, and, mm-hmm. and Carol, uh, I think, makes jewelry. She's not, I don't know if she's doing music anymore, but, okay. but they were great, and we had a little kind of, you know, a, a little outfit that could... could make pretty music but have a little tempo and, and yeah. some harmonies and stuff and, and I had a different energy than me playing by myself um, but it was still pretty folk folkish mm-hmm. um, and uh, but my second record was more uh, full band rocking um, and it got on the radio mm-hmm. I had some some success with Texas radio and, and Americana radio and but in Texas in particular it kind of blew up and and all of a sudden my audience went from uh older kind of folky crowd to younger rowdier yeah um let's have a good time crowd sure. and uh I was still at a point where any crowd <laughs> is a good crowd, yeah, a good good crowd. Thing, yeah. you know, like, I, I wasn't being too picky about it I was just yeah. blown away I was like what, yeah. when, when you mean this club sold out like there were two people here last time I came right. so I wasn't uh, too hung up about it I just mm. was doing what I did but um, but the the good thing about not having success is there's you could kind of, there's nothing to lose and right. there's no there's not that pressure there yeah. in the same way as, as when I did have some success and you know relatively limited but for me it was it was uh, a big deal mm-hmm. um, then all of a sudden there's there's more pressure like how right. do you follow this up how do you give these people what they want do you give them what they want yeah or do you just keep um, making art you want because that's what got you there in the first place kind of a thing or, yeah yeah, that's a lot yeah. 
And uh, so it, those conversations come in. It's like, well, I, I just made more money than I'd made in, you know, last three months. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in a, in a but show. I'm not yeah. sure that this thing is sustainable or, <laughs> like, this is the lane I want to stay in. And, yeah. and, you know, how do you continue to evolve and when you're, when you when you have an audience before you're fully formed uh, that's yeah. an interesting yeah that's an interesting thing because yeah that so basically what you're saying is it was almost happy accident because of the the band and the radio success that did that little overnight push but you were still finding yourself you think as an artist or a songwriter at that point that second album yeah i mean yeah. well I, I think i was not ready to be locked into a genre right so yeah. uh you know, the Texas country thing was, mm -hmm. was exploding mm -hmm. and there were a lot of benefits to that and that there were you know, a lot of great radio stations that mm -hmm. would, would play the music and a lot of fans that were, were in, yeah. you know, they were, they, they found something they liked and, and all of a sudden you could, you could <laughs> be packing out clubs. Right. And that was really exciting to me, but I also felt a little limited in some ways because I also saw the downside of that, which was that was a pretty narrow lane mm -hmm. musically. If you wanted um, to keep doing that and keep getting on the radio and that kind of a thing. Well, just... not so much the radio as the audience attention or interest sure. in you. It was, yeah. it felt like, okay, we love this, mm -hmm. uh, but don't veer too far from that or you're, right. you're going to lose us. It always mm -hmm. kind of felt like the, the unspoken conversation. Sometimes it yeah. was spoken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And so that was the thing was, okay, I've, I've, got, I've, I've got to this point. Do I just repeat myself mm -hmm. and so that I don't risk losing these people? Or, or do you continue to explore and, and maybe, maybe lose some of them in the process? Right. Well, from an outside viewpoint, I mean, and it's always different. Everybody's viewpoint is different. From, from me, it's an interesting, you have an interesting mix of like, you know, bluegrass and country and all and all these things but with that fundamental texas singer songwriter like guy clark towns van zandt song you know craft to me so i don't care who you are it's like a really great song which you write really great songs <laughs> it's it's gonna it's gonna stand you know what i mean so i i can i totally understand also on the artist side of things like you gotta you gotta eat and you're trying to figure figure that out and you don't want to feel beholden but it seems like uh, you've kind of balanced that well, which is I, interesting, like, that maybe you think you haven't? I don't know. Well, I tried to. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it was important to me to I always, I, I just didn't want to be locked into the same thing. I didn't want yeah. to be pigeonholed. So yeah. I wanted to be able to go out and play a folk show solo yeah. or, you know, just a songwriter show in a listening room mm -hmm. because that's what I feel I'm best at and, mm -hmm. and I enjoy that. But I also wanted to be able to take a band out on the road and, and play big dance halls and yeah. big theaters, and and I wanted the best of both worlds. Um, and to some degree, I've been fortunate that I've, I think I've been able to walk that line yeah. to where I have some of both. Um, but uh, at the time when you're going through it, it it for me uh, it just felt um, like that was one of the issues I was having to deal with. Is like yeah. is. Uh, um, you know, here's the creation. How do you do this without worrying about the people on the outside yeah. and what they think about it and, and how much money you're going to make and what yeah. the response is? And because once you get into that, you, you, the, the, the artist part, of you, you start surrendering some part of that. Sure. <clears throat> and I was really uncomfortable with that idea. And, uh, but I also was really uncomfortable with the idea of, of being broke. Starving to death, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so, you know, I think I've navigated and there are worse, there are bigger challenges in yeah. the world. But uh, yeah. for me, you know, on my sort of career path, that's been one of the, the constants is how do I stay true to myself um, and, and, and prioritize the art, but pay yeah. attention to the career. Cool. And that is interesting. Like, so the, uh, the band versus solo, do you view them as almost separate acts? Like... Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it sort of depends wh what record I'm working or, mm -hmm. or where I'm at. Um, uh, but yeah, they're different, they're different things. I mean, uh, sort of by necessity, mm -hmm. um, like if I'm solo, I don't have, there are certain tools I don't have. I don't have a guitar player to take, take the solo. <laughs> I don't yeah. have 
a drummer to keep the train beat going. Mm. I don't have some of those things that can uh, uh, fight over the noise yeah. that you have sometimes in a, in a rock show sure. um, with the audience. Um, and so I have to use other tools. I have to be able to tell a story. I have mm-hmm. to be able to to engage people in between songs and and focus more on my own guitar playing and my delivery in, in a different way. Yeah. Um, and uh, which I like. I really love the connection I feel with people on that way because there's not this this filter of noise. Right. Yeah. Like a rowdy um, club. Yeah. Um, so that's that's I think my favorite feeling is when I just feel like I've got people. I'm, I'm connected to them and, and mm-hmm. um, can feel them. They can feel me. Um, which can happen with a band. Sure. It's just not as, it's a little more difficult to achieve sometimes. Yeah. Because you're playing louder, you're more up tempo generally. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the venues are places where people are standing up and drinking and, right. and you know, some want to dance. Expecting something and, different, yeah, kind of, too. They're expecting yeah. a certain energy on a Saturday night right. at the rock club then, or at the honky tonk. <laughs> yeah. Then, you know, uh, uh, an evening at a nice sit down theater. Yeah. That's cool though. I think that's an, it's, it's cool you're able able to do both. You know, I mean, because it takes to, it's, to me playing solo almost is more work than playing with a band because it's a, a huge amount of mental energy to to keep them and, and be locked in with it. And it's also it is. Really special, but it is, and it's yeah. it can be nerve wracking and challenging. But <laughs> it, when it works, it's the best feeling in the world. Right? Yeah. I, that's why I, I love it. Is it, there is that that connection there that's possible that I just. Yeah. have never quite felt in the same way mm-hmm. with a band. Yeah. How about as a listener, have you been in any uh, situations or shows um, with any of your heroes or just artists you admire in, in that type of situation, a solo situation where you're in the listener's seat and wrapped on the, on the other end of it? You oh, know yeah. What I mean? Oh, yeah. Uh, the first, the most memorable one for me was, was Ray Wiley Hubbard. Mm-hmm. Um, he came in and... As soon as he was sound checking, uh, just playing his guitar and these open tunings, or it was probably drop D, and but it just sounded cool. Yeah. And then when he opened his mouth to sing, I realized these songs are not just the typical songs, mm-hmm. even the ones that are, you know, pretty real blues based and caveman and stay on one chord <laughs> yeah. and are singing about crazy stuff. Right. There there was a, a uniqueness there. There's something left of center that was cool. Mm-hmm. But he also had these this this really poetic language. Um and he was speaking about things. He wasn't just trying to rhyme. Yeah. Um he had something to say. He mm-hmm. had something to say and and wasn't afraid to say it. And it and that was really moving to me and inspiring mm-hmm. to me. And uh, and then he was just funny as hell. He was from the very beginning. I was engaged, yeah. and that's something you know. I I, I like. Uh, I I love to watch talented people, but mm-hmm. I don't know if it's an attention span issue or what. But uh, I don't care how good you are, if you're just gonna sit up there and play for an hour and a half, and not like interact, connect at all. Yeah. with the audience, I, I lose interest. Yeah, and. And I've always been drawn to people, whether it's Ray or uh, Todd Snyder or Fred Eagle Smith or uh, John Prine or yeah, um, a lot of folks, not just musically, though a lot of those people have a lot of things in common, but on stage they're master storytellers and entertainers yeah. and they're funny. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah. and I that that just that keeps me entertained. And it gives me that emotional ride that I really like. Um, and I try to put in my own shows is, you know, when I first started writing, a lot of my stuff was, was sad mm-hmm. and long and I, it was really <laughs> challenging to keep an audience's attention. Right. Um, and you know, I was studying towns and, mm-hmm. and like trying to recreate that in some way. And I, not only could I not, um, you know, I was doing really, really poor man versions of, of attempted town songs, but, uh, um, uh, so, uh, but it's, so if I didn't have the the songs there, uh, you know, it was just gonna be a long night for everybody. But what I noticed about Towns is not only did he have amazing songs, but he's also funny in between. Yeah. So yeah. he could play these slit your wrist, um, 
ballads and story songs and then uh, and have people really low, but then he could lighten the mood with a joke. A Maybe joke, a yeah. terrible joke, but... It's still, uh, yeah, and, a relief. Yeah, and so I early on I started doing that, and I found, at least in the beginning, I probably had more gift for that hmm. than for the songwriting part. Interesting. And it's both storytelling, though, to some degree. So, yeah, that's, that's fascinating to me. I totally agree with you. I mean, Prine, I think, is the best example of that. Robert O'Keen also does yeah. a great job of it. Um, but So when you put a set together, a solo set like that, the, the in-between stuff, I mean, do you, do you does it take time to sit down and, and figure it out and almost write it like a act well, or is it spontaneous sometimes I mean, just because you're both. naturally talented yeah at this point yeah. I don't uh, I don't write it down like when I was first starting let's say I'd have a 30 minute set opening mm-hmm. for somebody yeah um, you know I'd have, I'd have five songs right um, <laughs> and and they're bummers right and, and so I would I would sketch I would um, scratch out like here's my set list and here's maybe something I can talk about in between. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was not focused. Like I, 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 I tend to meander, as, uh-huh. as if that's not clear. Already. <laughs> and on stage, um, I didn't have bits. I didn't write out scripts. Okay. But what I did do was I played a lot. Yeah. I played a whole lot. Yeah. And, and I would go out there every night and just try and wing it. And I would try bits out, and then and I would just start talking and see yeah. what came up. Yeah, and that was fun. It was like you're on a tightrope, and yeah. you're like, okay, am I gonna make it, or am I gonna crash and burn? <laughs> right. Uh, and and you know, I would there I, times where I'd crash and burn and say, okay, let's don't go down that road again. <laughs> and then, but then sometimes this one, something would come out, and and I'd say that was pretty good, and that got yeah. a good reaction. Let me let me work on that, and and it wouldn't be some sitting at home and writing on it. It would just sure. be the next night. Okay, let's do that, and and let's see if we can evolve it. And okay. and sometimes it would, it would uh, regress and mm-hmm. and not be any good. And sometimes it would get a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And I just did that so many times over so many nights that for pretty much every song that I have, I probably have two or three. Oh. Anecdotes or yeah. or setups or whatever um, to to that I know. Okay, I can get a laugh like this, or this is an interesting way to to describe the the yeah. origin of this song, and and, yeah. uh, and that was fun. And and when I got, I just got a lot of good <laughs> feedback early on about uh, uh, how that made people connect with what I was doing, yeah. and it was interesting too looking at at other writers. Like there were guys that were way better guitar players than I were, or better mm-hmm. singers than I were, and 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 in a lot of cases better writers than I was. Mm-hmm. But I felt like my one advantage early on was that I was a little better than most at at, at engaging with the audience. Yeah. And then the, and that bought me some time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Until some of the other stuff, <laughs> until up. my songwriting can catch up. <laughs> That's interesting. That's cool. So yeah, so no substitute for just work yeah Put, putting in that work yeah yeah it's hard to, it's hard to uh do a test run without an audience there's there's no yeah, substitute yeah, that's true, for yeah. the energy of an audience and being able to read the room and say yeah. okay i need to eject this is not working or i can go a little deeper here mm-hmm. and like this audience is they're they're trusting me and i'm going to challenge them a little bit uh-huh. and and so that that's what's really fun and you can do at a different level yeah. When you're in a listening room, then you can when you're in a honky tonk. Because some t- if I if I go on a five minute speech, ramble, it, you yeah. know, uh, then <laughs> then uh, uh, you know people are gonna head for the exits. Right. Yeah. So you got to know your know your audience. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the the Patreon thing. Are you still doing that? Uh, I'm not. It's still no. set up. I, yeah. I kind of put the kibosh on it for a little while. While yeah. uh, when my record came out. Um, because I would just need to be promoting that yeah, stuff. Yeah, got to work the record. Yeah, um, but, but I may I may fire it up again um, uh, in the new year. Yeah, was um, so this this new album were those songs from the Patreon thing or are these different songs? Uh, a lot of them, like nine of the eleven or twelve. I can't remember how many on the record, but mm-hmm. 
probably seventy five percent of them I had I had already worked up and released through okay. Patreon before really? I did the record. That's cool. So yeah. was that did that like free you up create uh, creatively? I guess. I mean, did it work for a while there? Did yeah, yeah. And for I mean, your, your listeners may not know, but this like Patreon oh, yeah. is is a uh, like a crowds. Uh, they're basically it's a digital supported. platform for, for people to become patrons. Patrons of, of, of artists they artists. like, whatever kind. There's photographers and yeah. digital graphic designers and, and journalists and writers and, and, yeah. and then song, musicians and songwriter, songwriters. And uh, I had, it had been five years in between my mm-hmm. previous two records. And um, I, you know, I was writing songs during that time, but it was kind of, it was like... There were songs that maybe this doesn't fit on this record, and mm. they, they said no home. I had no home yeah. for them, and I wanted a way to 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 stay active and be able to get stuff out and get feedback on it, and and be able to be in the studio and try out new things. I didn't want it to be once every three years. I go in yeah. and get to work in the studio, so I just came up with this idea or to to join that and and basically try to release a song a month, and the supporters, you know, whatever money they contributed would would generally pay for the cost of going to the studio so i got to go in like i think i did 10 or 11 of them and and um got to go in a lot of different studios work a lot work with a lot of different producers and there was no pressure because it was only you know these three or four hundred fans and and it wasn't something where i'm going to be defined by this piece of work for the next right. three years and that really freed me up yeah creatively to go I can go make a reggae I can song imagine yeah that'd be really cool <laughs> whatever and and so uh, with this batch of songs I just got to try out different stuff and then by the time I got into the studio for real to make what mm-hmm. it is uh, my record yeah. um, I, I had some experience with those songs and I in some cases I knew what I wanted to do in some that's cases cool. I knew what I didn't because yeah. of that process yeah that's a that's a Interesting thing. It's got to be a balance you're always searching for, right? Like the, <laughs> the the freedom to just create, but also not get too out there and be too crazy. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I just you don't want to be uh, trapped by the. It's sort of similar to the the career stuff with the audience is mm-hmm. is is uh, if I went out and made some thing that creatively I, I wanted to do, but my audience didn't get it all like that could affect my career in a certain way but I also wouldn't get to scratch that itch yeah and uh this provided me the ability to go and to go and try that stuff out without too many without any negative consequences yeah that's cool um and I love all your records what five or six how many you have six uh six six yeah, yeah. I'm a, I really am a big fan of all of them this most recent one um a lot of great songs I wonder if you talk about um, times like these because to me, I think it's always a challenge to like not be preachy when you're trying to get a message across, yeah. right? But in that song, I feel like you really did a great job with that. And like when people hear truth, there's it's kind of undeniable when that song has a lot of truth in it. So obviously that's what you were going for, I assume, when you... When you wrote that song, yeah, to do, I, a, do a commentary. But I mean, also, I was pissed off, world. but I also yeah. see a lot of other people pissed off, and I don't care mm-hmm. what side of the political divide you're on. Yeah, um, I, I think most people, uh, uh, if they're not watching the news constantly, mm-hmm. would uh, agree that we have more that unites us than divides us. Yeah, we have more, more common, common than, than, yeah. than, than, than differences. Yeah. And what I was seeing in in politics was was the the heightening of the division. And and it just it bothers me that that elected officials and people that whose job it is is to unite us mm-hmm. um, were were using that platform to to divide. Yeah. And that's just frustrating to me as a citizen and and I got that that um sense from a lot of people. So that was written um that that was 
coming from me, but also you know channeling what I what I felt about a lot of uh, what a lot of other people were feeling. Yeah, as I think well. a lot of people can relate to that, and I totally agree. We all have a lot more in common. That's what's so funny. It seems like the larger you go in terms of groups or whatever, you know, the further this this conception uh, misconception gets. That everybody's further apart, but the the narrower you get when it comes down to two people talking, most people are. Uh, pretty in agreement with most of the goals you know and it is yeah. it's really surprising i don't understand why it's that's not talked about more you know the, the goals we have in common right yeah so, and i and that yeah. that bothers me i mean i i have my own theories on why it's not talked well, about sure, more, yeah, i whatever, think it's yeah. effective it's yeah. an effective way yeah. to to get people riled up is, is to, to point out the differences and the threats that yeah. everybody provides yeah, yeah. um but you know i i I have friends all over the country, all over the world. A lot of them I don't agree with politically on a lot of mm-hmm. issues. And um, and I want to be able to have a healthy debate. But I don't want that to be that those differences to turn into um, uh, something that makes them other. Right. Because they are people. They are neighbors. They yeah. are friends. They are people that I know I can count on if I needed them. Mm-hmm. And I may not agree with this particular view, mm-hmm. but short of of uh, violence or overt racism, um, you know, I, uh, I can I can probably still maintain a relationship yeah. with them. And and um, uh, but these days it's 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 getting harder and harder to do that if you listen to all the the outside voices yeah. that are trying to say that they're wrong and they're sure. evil and and. Um, um, and I think on whatever side you're on, that's uh, people get labeled yeah. uh, with a with a, a negative intent that isn't always there. I think, as I say in the lyric, I just want to do my labor, love my girl, <laughs> and help my neighbor. That's right. And uh, I, I think that's you know that's pretty universal. We yeah. want to take care of our families, Absolutely. be good people, and uh, and contribute to the world. And, and uh, yeah. so that was just me hollering about that. Yeah. Times like these, everyone could use a hand. Instead of standing around losing ground, but I know the promised land. It's so hard to tell if this is heaven or hell, and I can never miss a bad degree. What is that part of a part of your mission? Like that's how you can help the world. Is that what you're trying to do? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know how much I'm helping the world. Well, but, uh, I, I think uh, it is a help. That's what I'm saying. Like because if they, if you're not saying that, then everything else is just running wild. So, well, you know, yeah. I always quote Todd Snyder. He's got a great line. Um, he says, "I don't write these songs to change anybody's mind. I, I write them to ease my own." Yeah, and. Um, you know, I I've never really touched on social issues or politics a, a whole lot in my work. I, I was inspired really early on by by Bob Dylan and, and his ability and the ability of a lot of folk singers and, and rock and roll artists to uh, to do that. Um, I just never felt super comfortable doing it or felt very adept yeah. at it. Um, uh, but on this last record, I, I, I dove in a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of got over some of those fears. Yeah. And and there were things that, like Todd said, I needed to do to ease my own mind. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad I did. That's cool. Well, it's a great record that way for sure. 
Um, are there any? Uh, did you write all the songs yourself on this one, or were there co-writes as well? Uh, yeah, a lot of co-writes. Lot of co-writes uh, yeah. I wrote uh, about a half dozen of them with my wife, right. uh, Allison Moore, yeah. and um, uh, so it was. That was interesting, and in you know, having your, your partner be your creative partner in a lot of, in some sense, and she co-produced the record as well. Oh, neat. Um, so, uh, you know, she was just the person that I talked about this with, and she understood my vision and and and. Um, uh, is a great artist, yeah. and she's made I don't know ten records, and she's great, yeah, and great um, has done a lot of work and has a lot of experience and, and a, an interesting point of view and a different style, um, way more disciplined than I am, yeah, and uh, uh, and and just gets to the heart of the matter in a way that I don't <laughs> traditionally, right. And so it was good. I learned a lot uh, about being a little more direct and it sort of ties into what we were talking about is you know if I feel this whether it's about a relationship or about my own life or about the world around me um, uh, you know sometimes you can just say that yeah and, you, know, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you don't, have to, don't have to cloak it in, in <laughs> disguise and, yeah. and, uh, so anyway so we did a lot of writing together and then uh, uh, Matresa Berg co-wrote one of the songs uh uh, Charlie Mars mm. and uh, uh, Lolo, an artist Lolo, uh, yeah. out of Tennessee, mm-hmm. and then um, Adam Landry, okay. uh, who's a guitar player, producer um, in Nashville, uh, and a friend of mine and an occasional bandmate. He he co-wrote uh, three of the songs with me. Mm. So I think there I think there's three that I did on my own, and then the other ones are co-writes. Yeah, and what are the differences that you find when you're co-writing versus writing by yourself you're talking about discipline or direction are there yeah I mean if I'm writing on my, on my own it, I can it can literally take me 15 years to finish a song <laughs> uh, um, you know I'm one of those people that I, I have a hard time keeping a journal because yeah. uh, I'm so critical of what I'm writing I think that's terrible throw it just away just throw it away yeah. um, and also just very undisciplined, and and so I'll have an idea, but I always I, I always I always just waited. I, I thought, well, Dylan, he just has some magical link. Towns mm-hmm. has some magical link. There's they're just they've got their antennas up and they're tuned, and then the gods send them down this brilliant idea, yeah. and they put it out there, and maybe they use drugs or alcohol or or God knows what, yeah. but but. Uh, that that's how they're able to do that, and there's mm-hmm. with those two in particular, there's uh, an enormous amount of talent, yeah, um, of God given talent. But what I discover later is Bob Dylan worked his ass off, <laughs> just like wrote a lot of songs. He wrote every day, and like was was you know uh, in some in some capacity was wow. being an artist every day, and still is in his eighties. Yeah, and. Um, uh, I always forget who said the quote, but it says, "Yeah, I, 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 I need inspiration to write, and I find it every day at eight a.m. when I sit down at my desk." Oh, right. Yeah. And um, so, basically, to wrap it up, I, to, on my own, I'm not sitting down at eight a.m. at right. my desk, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a lot of times it can take me a long time to to get in the weeds and hammer out a song. Mm-hmm. With a co-writing situation, uh, I find I'm much more productive because you're sitting there with somebody trying to work and you can't just check out and right. go watch TV right. or, or get on the internet <laughs> or whatever because it's just an awkward situation and mm. so you're going there for a job and and that keeps me focused. You kind uh, of hold each other accountable kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so I enjoy that, and I also enjoy different perspectives. Um, uh, there, I mean, there's times where it's I really like to just use my own voice and, and find my way through it like a puzzle. Yeah. Um, but uh, and, and and it's not conducive to other people writing. Mm-hmm. But but there are times where a lot of times where um, you have an idea and you just can't get out of the ditch with it, and 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 somebody you sit down with somebody and they. They help you uh, articulate it and 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 find that story and and make it unique and they bring a different set of skills um, that 
that I often don't have. And, and uh, <laughs> right. so it's cool. Like, I mean, I have my strengths and I like working with people that have their own set of strengths. And, mm-hmm. and when you can combine those things, you get something that I, I wouldn't be able to get on my own. Yeah. And that's the exciting part, right? Cause it wouldn't exist if, if the two of you hadn't gotten together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so. really magical when it works. Yeah. It can be terrible when it doesn't, but uh, <laughs> sure. um, it's just awkward. But, uh, yeah. but when it works, I, 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 f- I find the benefits outweigh the, the downsides. Well, that's cool. Yeah, it's certainly a very personal thing. So sitting down and writing a song with somebody else, <laughs> bearing your soul, you have to be kind of friendly. Even most of the people you write with, you friends with first or respect oh, or admire? Or yeah, it's all kinds uh, yeah. of situations. When I first started out, um, I had a friend named John Evans that I wrote with a little bit. and um, <clears throat> uh, But my second ever co-write was with Guy Clark. Wow. Really? Second ever? Yeah. Wow. Um, and and then shortly after that with Ray Wiley Hubbard, oh um, <laughs> and and that was just you know I met Guy at a party, uh, an after show one time, and we stayed up all night. He was picking and wow. bumming cigarettes off me, and and uh, but I got his number, and a couple weeks later I called him up and just said I'm I'm going to be in Nashville. You probably don't remember me, but I'm going to be in town. You know, would you be up for writing a song? Wow. And he said yes, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And I just thought, you know, there's no school for this. I mean, there, maybe there is, but I I, mm. I didn't attend it. And yeah. So uh, the um, and I knew I had a whole lot to learn. And so, uh, particularly early on, finding finding the masters and trying to figure out a way to to get some uh, some knowledge from them was really important to me. Yeah. Um, so and Ray was really good about that. Not just the writing, but even when we weren't writing, talking about the craft and, and, and what's important and what's not. Yeah. And, uh, so that was, that was really huge for me to have some of those guys that, that, um, had lived and had that experience, uh, to help guide me. Yeah. That's important. And it also speaks to, to you. Obviously they saw something in you, right? I mean, it's, it's, I think that's, that's true. And yeah, you're lucky to have that for sure. <laughs> I was I was really lucky yeah. and and uh, uh, yeah whether they saw something or just were, wanted me to stop calling <laughs> stop bugging uh, yeah I don't know but <laughs> uh, but it it worked out in a little yeah. bit well, that's cool um, how if if any how is like Texas and, and the West influenced your writing I, I find that your imagery the way you you lay out imagery is incredible um, so like landscapes in the in the spaces do that kind of influence it or not so much uh i'm sure it does yeah. it, it's it's uh, it's probably more of a song by song yeah basis, basis. Yeah, yeah, you know sure. there, there are times where i'm trying to be really cinematic mm-hmm. and there are times where i'm trying to be uh very detailed and yeah. so it's i i sometimes you, you're zooming in mm-hmm. on an action or an emotion or a description and sometimes you're you're zooming out and trying to leave a lot of room and space uh, to just create a vibe and 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 uh, a world that your characters will inhabit or just create a feeling. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in the suburbs uh, in a pine forest. Um, lived by the ocean for a while, mm. uh, but I've been you know all over Texas and and all over the world. But it's certainly growing up. You know, there was a mystique about Texas and the West and, and the cowboys and country music and <laughs> all of that, that that permeated the culture, and, and I definitely soaked up. Yeah. Um, how much of that made it into my my work? Uh, I'm not I'm not honestly sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just I I'm. I think I'm, more than anything, I was just drawn to if another artist played a song saying that made me feel like this. Yeah. How do I recreate that in my own work? Yeah. And so if that involved imagery of a certain mm-hmm. kind, it did. If yeah. it involved emotion of a certain kind, it, it did. did. Yeah. Um, but I, I think cool. that was probably a bigger influence for me personally as a writer than yeah. than the actual geography I was surrounded by. Yeah. That's cool. That's, that's a good answer. One more final, really, really heavy question. All right. Yeah. What's your favorite color? Blue. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you actually have one. No, this has been really cool and, and deep, and uh, I really enjoyed it, man. 
talking about all the, especially all the songwriting stuff. It's it's an honor. So thanks for sitting down with me. My I know pleasure. you got a show to play and a lot more shows to play as well. You're pretty busy. Yeah, days, right? yeah, I'm yeah trying to like stay after it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, cool. But yeah, well, it's good mm-hmm. talking to you. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, big thanks to Hayes for sitting down and chatting with me. I hope you enjoyed the interview. If you want to find out more about Hayes and his music, you can visit HayesCarl.com. That's H-A-Y-E-S-C-A-R-L-L.com. I believe that's his handle on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, the song we were talking about and that I, I put a clip in was called Times Like These, and that's from his album What It Is. You can find that at your local record store or on all the uh, digital platforms out there also youtube um so check out the full song for sure go buy it go download it go stream it go watch it all that good stuff if you'd like to know more about me and my music you can visit tyler t-y-l-l-e-r music.com if you want to find out more about this podcast or listen to some of the other episodes or watch some of the other episodes You can do that at CowboysIndians.com. Just search Tyler, T-Y-L-L-E-R, or search Tales from the Trail, and you'll find out a bunch more. You can also check out Cowboys Indians Magazine on Instagram and all the social media sites. And if you're watching this on YouTube, there's also an audio-only version uh, on all your favorite podcast platforms and on CowboysIndians.com. And if you're listening in the car or jogging or whatever you're doing there's also a video uh, on youtube so just go hop on youtube and search tales from the trail and search my name or go to cowboysindians.com once again and you can find the, the video that goes along with this thanks for tuning in i hope you enjoy it and uh hope to have you as a listener again see you down the trail mm-hmm.